Uh, thanks, great, great talk, Brendan. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jim Deepa. Uh, he's a senior project manager with uh, Jacob and Hefner Associates um, out of the, the Chicago area. I will point out that Jim started coming to the Florida Remediation Conference several years ago. Um, he was one of the, uh, he, he won our, our Young Presenters uh, Award several years ago with a, with a great presentation. Um, he should, you know, he does a great job with some visualization in his talk, so I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got for us today with regard to uh, uh, visualization tools. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so the, the 3D modeling and visualization of data, of, of subsurface data. So the three main reasons why I hear that consultants don't want to do that is because of cost, time it takes, and the amount of utility it might provide. I'm going to try to address those things and, and really show that, that that may have been true in the past, but it's really not true now. And so why is that? What's, what's changed? So first and foremost, the types of 3D del deliverables that can be produced. With older technology, you just get static deliverables, basically a screenshot. You know, there, there's, there's the plume, there's the core of the plume. You can kind of get a sense of where the contamination is. But now we can make interactive deliverables, animations, uh, and also web scenes, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention shortly. But here's an example of that same site uh, with, with uh, animation showing, that's actually LiDAR data of the ground surface, which is publicly available, uh, some MIP data, where that plume is, and then where the core is. So you just get a much better sense of where that contamination is located when you could just do a few rotations in the model. Uh, secondly, the number of data points. Previously, you were lucky to get 100 data points or a couple hundred data points, and that's typically from analytical data, soil and groundwater sample results, or, or boring logs. Now we have HRSC data and LIDAR data. We're getting thousands or even millions of data points. These are, this is from a membrane interface probe, uh, laser induced fluorescence tools, CPT data. You just generate an immense amount of data very quickly. Uh, thirdly, uh, because you have a lot of data, really this is important, the modeling run times. Uh, Ten years ago, the hardware was antiquated. It might take you uh, minutes or even hours to run a, a model and create a, a 3D model like this. But now it, it might only take seconds. And this is due to, to Moore's law, which states that the number of transistors on a microchip approximately doubles every two years while the cost is halved, which essentially means that technology is exponential, that the growth is exponential. So the time that it takes to create these things is really getting uh, drastically reduced. Uh, and then fourthly, uh, formatting the data and creating these deliverables. Uh, previously, it might have taken days or even weeks to create a 3D model. Now it could really be done in hours, and this is due to, to automation. And I think automation is, is talked about a lot but never really explained. So, so what are these tools that actually are used to automate uh, the, the, these uh, processes for creating 3D models? Uh, one is Visual Basic uh, macros in Excel. It's sort of the underlying language in Excel. I think this is really powerful and, and, and underutilized. You could just right now open up Excel and, and record yourself doing anything. Just uh, record the macro and just start typing and doing stuff in cells and look at that macro. And you could actually learn a little bit of Visual Basic very quickly and see the, see, see the coding language. Uh, next is Earth Volumetric Studio, or EVS by CTEC. It's this uh, uh, application-based software. You have modules and connect these modules to different uh, uh, other modules that perform an output. And these can be built to handle data sets repeatedly. And then Python scripting. And just like how Visual Basic is the underlying language in Excel, Python scripting is the underlying language in EVS. So you could do the same thing in EVS where you could record yourself performing any function you want in EVS, and it'll record that script. So you can actually learn Python pretty easily and, and get the language. Uh, so what do these things do exactly? I use uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Visual Basic and Excel to compile and build data, fit, data sets really efficiently. Uh, we've got macros that basically create an Excel file from any file type, like a, a, a text file or an MHP file or any really kind of file type with one button press, you have an Excel file. Uh, then you could merge those worksheets all together all at once with another Excel macro and then reference a, coordinate, a set of coordinates and really in a, a task that may have taken a junior level geologist a half a day or a day to do can now be done in, in five minutes. Uh, EVS can be used to process and visualize data sets repeatedly. A lot of times these, these projects that come in are, uh, even though the projects are different, the data sets are the same, whether you're dealing with MIP data or LIF data, um, they're, they're all formatted the same way. And, 
applications can be built to handle these data sets. So you could statistically model this data in 3D very quickly, process and visualize LiDAR data, or, or build cross-sections from a 3D model. And then finally, with Python scripting, uh, we could create data deliverables automatically. Essentially, with a, a short Python script, you can compi uh, compile these 3D model data sets uh, into a, a 3D model, out output sequential maps, or perform mathematical computations. And actually, yeah, that Python script up there is a, a script that'll actually cut a 3D model at various elevations and produce a set of maps very quickly. <coughs> uh, so I think that that's really more of the how uh, of this is done a little bit, but now more of the why. Um, why do we want to use these tools? And I think the best way to do that is with a uh, case study here. And this was a, a former manufacturing operation in Chicago. Uh, operated for about 40 years from the 40s to the 80s, and that's a fire insurance map circa 1950. And you can see there's four ASTs on site, and one of those was a degreasing solvent tank. Uh, so obviously, we needed to do an investigation here during a, a phase two. Uh, and the geology at this site, uh, the top three feet was a, a coarse-grained urban fill. Uh, the next, uh, down to 11 feet, was a silty lacustrian clay from uh, Lake Michigan deposits. And down to 25 feet was a dense clay glacial till, you know, ex extremely dense and hard. Uh, the hydrogeology of the site, uh, groundwater is about 10 feet down, sitting on top of that glacial till, and the flow is very slow to the south-southeast. And the investigations that were performed, uh, the first was a limited phase two investigation where we performed nine borings. Obviously, we did a boring by that degreasing solvent tank, and lo and behold, got a TC concentration of soil of 24,600 milligrams per kilogram. So that soil sample was, uh, you know, 2.5% TCE. And we also found a significant amount of TC right next to the existing building. So we, needed to, we knew we needed to perform some additional investigations. Uh, next, we performed an MIHPT, a membrane interface probe hydraulic profiling tool investigation, 32 points. And those are those 32 points right there. Uh, from aerial photography, we found that those tanks are actually oriented slightly angled like that, and the TC tank is shown in red. And then after that membrane interface probe investigation, where we sort of uh, figured out uh, the limits of the uh, contamination, we performed a soil investigation to get some actual analytical concentrations. So we did another 41 borings, and those are the locations right there with uh, five monitoring wells. There's also a monitoring well to the northwest that's not shown that's more upgradient that was uh, not impacted. So this is, this is a lot of data. 32 borings from a MIHBT investigation produced tens of thousands of data points. We had over 100 soil samples from those 41 borings. And the best way to look at this data is to build a 3D conceptual site model and deliver it as a web scene. Now, this to me is probably one of the biggest advancements in the last few years. Uh, previously, using EVS by CTEC, um, you would build what was called a 4DIM, and you'd uh, give this 4DIM to the client, and I, I realized that some of the clients weren't even opening them. They either couldn't or wouldn't install the software that was needed to view the file. That's all changed now. You could build these 3D web scenes, and all you need to do is go to that website. You guys should go to that website right now, and you'll get this screen. And you drag and drop that CTWS file right into there, and you don't need any additional software. You could rotate, zoom in and out, and, and turn off various components in the model. And that's what I'll show right here. Essentially, this is just me recording myself doing this, dragging the 3D model into this web scene, rotating it. That was public, publicly available LiDAR data. You could turn on and off the tanks, the existing sewers, and the existing building. And then we could start turning on the PID data, that initial screening investigation to show where those uh, samples were collected and what the concentrations <laughs> were, or the response were, I should say. That's the extent at 100,000 microvolts, and then at a million, and then at, I'll show it 10 million that shows the core. So you could see sort of where that contamination is located. Then data from the hydraulic profiling tool that shows the geology of the site the urban fill on top, the silty clay, and the dense clay till in gray. And you could also model this in 3D as well to show that 3D geologic unit of the, of the dense clay till. And we'll turn all that off and then show the TC samples, the actual analytical data, and colored by concentration there. Green samples are essentially clean, below 15. And then that model is at 10 milligrams per kilogram at 100, 1,000, and then at 10,000 to show the core again. 
So I think this particular tool has been great for, for presenting to the client, to contractors, to, to pretty much give them the whole big picture, exactly what's going on at this site, what the geology is, where the contamination is. But when the rubber meets the road and now you need to design a remediation system, these aren't super helpful. They're just sort of give, give you the big picture. So you really have to start dissecting the model to create the maps and cross sections that we're more used to seeing. So first, you can make a footprint map. Now this looks like a 2D map, but essentially it's a 3D model that's projected into 2D. So there's a 3D component to this. The one on the left is from the PID results, and the one on the right is from the TC analytical data. And you can see how there's very good correlation at this site. Um, at this site, we had very little uh, degradation products. It was almost all TCE, and it really matched up very perfectly. Uh, so, so this really showed us that uh, we, we were delineated. The, the MIP points really showed that we had a, a good idea of what the extent of this contamination was. Um, you could also then, we could use some Python code to slice this model in, in, in from 3D and show what this contamination looked like at, at different depth intervals. And this, once again, was, is a button press to basically create all these maps. And I think this is, this is a fantastic map to show where the contamination is located in the surface and sort of how it migrated at depth and where it terminates. And uh, interestingly, that, that lower section, is, it's, it's lower in elevation, so we think it's kind of spilled and migrated to the south there and, and entered a sewer and, 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 got, and that's how it sort of got deeper in the, in the subsurface. Uh, we could also slice this 3D model uh, and, and, and create transects uh, and cross sections through any transect we want very quickly. And this really shows the geology real well, the, the urban fill in blue, the silty clay in, in brown, and the clay till in, in gray, and shows how that contamination migrated in the subsurface. Uh, we could also estimate the volumes of impacted soil at any concentration. Uh, this, once again, is also a macro that, or a, a Python script that one button press and you get all this, all this data all at once. So you have TC on the x-axis and the volume of impacted soil on the, on the y and a, and a tabular data on the right there. And this is, I think, fantastic for uh, cost estimation, knowing, ex knowing really how much contaminated soil you have at each concentration. And why those two numbers are highlighted, the 15 and the 1,000, is because 15 milligrams per kilogram is the industrial commercial remedial objective at this site. So uh, if, if, if we don't want any uh, institutional controls on the site, that's what we're going to have to get down to. And the 1,000 milligrams per kilogram is about the soil saturation limit. So no matter what we do, that soil we, we have to treat, we have to get rid of. Um, so that's, that's what that 15 milligram per kilogram looks like in yellow. We'll see that picture more uh, in the upcoming slides. And that's what that 1,000 milligram per kilogram limit looks like in, in red. And what we could also do using this, the EGS software is estimate the amount of, of TC mass in the subsurface soils using uh, soil density values. And at this site, we found about, uh, calculated about 62,000 pounds of TC in the subsurface, and the great majority of that was uh, sitting in the silty clay, about 82%, and most of the rest of it was in that clay till. And this isn't super surprising, as this spill is uh, you know, at probably 50 years old, so over the decades, uh, gravity and rainwater infiltration has really leached a lot of that contamination out of the urban fill uh, in, into the silty clay and, and into that uh, clay till. So now that we have all the pieces, we, we have the maps, the cross sections, the, uh, the, the volume calculations, the, the mass estimates, now we could start using all those pieces to figure out, uh, to cost out remediation technology options. And the four that we used at this site were a, a, a simple excavation, a thermal treatment, soil mixing, and in-situ injection. So first, we looked at excavation, uh, pretty, pretty traditional. We, we, we have our volume of impacted soil, that's that 15 milligram per kilogram option. Uh, but of course, you can't just dig that out surgically. You have to have uh, you know, a, a, a hole with, with, with sides on it. And you could put in any soap from horizontal you want. And for this exercise, we used 60, 75, and 90 degrees from, from horizontal. And this will uh, play here. This is in, in green there is 60. And then at, uh, it, at light blue is a 75 degree slope from horizontal. And it looks more because there's a vertical exaggeration, but that's, uh, that's, that's 75. And then at 90 in dark blue. And essentially at 90, you'd need sheet piling. You know you're not going to be able to just dig you know, straight down without it collapsing. So you need sheet piling all around there, which is going to add to the cost. 
uh, but you could also then calculate what those volumes are. The amount of impacted soil for each of those scenarios is that 3,600 cubic yards at 15 milligrams <laughs> per kilogram, and then you can calculate the clean overburden in all three of those options and get your volume of impacted soil. And uh, those are some big numbers. Uh, if we had to do 90 degrees, it's, it, it's not that big, but you'd have to do a lot of sheet piling. But of course, this site, like most others, you can't just do a, usually a, a, a circle excavation around. You're gonna, you're gonna run into buildings or property boundaries, and this, this site was no different. If we did an excavation here, we'd have to customize it, where we'd have a 60 degree slope on the east and west walls, and a 90 degree slope on the north and south walls because we're running into the building to the south and the property boundary to the north, so we need sheet piling. In addition, we wouldn't be able to get to that soil that's impacted below the building that's shown in yellow there. If I kind of rotate this model, you'll see that. We'd have to treat that separately. We kind of knew this wasn't going to be an option, but we wanted to present it anyway just to sort of uh, perform the exercise because this, this is uh, over 10,000 cubic yards of, of, of soil, and which would come out to, with all that sheet piling, would, would be in the 10 to $14 million range. It's just not an option. Plus, a lot of those impacted soils would still have to be treated because they're over the 60 milligram per kilogram limit, limit of the land ban, so it wouldn't be able to be treated and uh, disposed of at a landfill without being treated first. So this just really wasn't an option. Uh, the next option we looked at was in situ thermal. We basically took all of the, our, our data and uh, made treatment cells. There, you can see in the upper right the 10 treatment cells. We'll show this in 3D so that we basically built these treatment cells to encompass the uh, modeled extent of impacted soil and then we went to all the clean samples. So we knew that was really going to be the extent of the, uh, the treatment volume for thermal. And there's our volumes at uh, 15 and 1,000. And then uh, pretty easily we could calculate what the cubic yards using the depth, the width, and the length of each of those boxes uh, uh, of, of, of each of those treatment cells are and sum them up. And we get about 7,700 cubic yards of, of soil that we need to treat. Uh, this definitely is, is on the table as an option. Uh, the next option we looked at is, is something that's, uh, that's new to me, it might be new to some, some other people in here, that steam-enhanced steam soil mixing, essentially using a large diameter auger and going, uh, this, this particular one is 10 feet in diameter, and, and injecting steam, uh, and then vacuuming that, that, that mixture out in the contamination, the vapor phase, and, and basically doing multiple passes until you uh, get, meet your remedial goals and then polishing it with ZBI. Uh, so this is the proposed treatment plan originally, which were uh, 10 feet diameter augers. The spacing was 13.5% overlap, which is the minimum spacing you would need for complete coverage, and that would be uh, 167 augers. We thought that that was probably a little bit overkill, so we did a little bit of a redesign and did the circles, uh, the augers on the outside a little more tangential, and the interior still uh, at that 13.5% overlap, and reduce the number of augers to 134. Uh, so by 33 augers, that's going to probably save the client a couple hundred thousand dollars at least. Um, then we could basically get uh, the coordinates of all these auger locations and the, 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 the es estimate the treatment depths based on the 3D model. There's our 15 milligram per kilogram option again and 1,000. And we could turn on our augers and see that we're, which soils we're treating. Once again, we still have that area under the building that we're still gonna have to treat differently because we just can't get there with that building in place. But this really shows that we are, are, are gonna be treating all of those soils. We can calculate the volume of cubic soil there, which is about 6,500 cubic yards. And what I think is really cool about this is we could also create some really good maps to use in the field. Um, the one on the left there is the anticipated auger depth of each of those 134 augers from about uh, 13 feet in depth to some of the deepest ones at 23 feet. And then the estimated TCE mass at each of those augers, which I think is, is, is really slick because what we're going to do is, uh, if we do perform this option, we're going to choose some really heavily impacted points and uh, see how well the technology works so that if it doesn't work, uh, we can basically pull the plug on the whole operation without spending a whole lot of money. It, we're still it, getting the machinery out there is still going to cost some, but at least uh, we uh, will perform sort of a, 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 a pilot test before we go full scale. 
And then finally, uh, in situ injection. Um, now it was determined pretty early on that in situ injection wasn't gonna work at this site for, for two reasons. Uh, the geology just isn't amenable to traditional injection and the amount of mass in the subsurface is uh, just, just not gonna work with other types of technologies that rely on diffusion. It would, would take too much time and, and probably require multiple injections. But I uh, thought I'd just present this anyway as sort of a uh, just a proof of concept that this, this can be done at, at other sites. So using uh, some, some Python code, we could drop in injection well locations at any radius of influence we want, and these are at eight foot centers. We need 187 wells to target this uh, 15 milligram per kilogram option. Uh, we could also look at it in side view. So there's a cross section through AA prime, which is that 1700 series to the south. We could turn on the geology to see sort of where we have uh, our impacts and what the geologic setting is, is anticipated to be. But uh, using Python tools, we, can't, we just don't have to do one uh, cross-section. We, we could create these cross-sections in sequence all at once with really a button press and then look at all those maps and create an understandable injection plan for, for the field. Essentially, what the coordinates of each injection well are, what the treatment depth is, uh, the top and bottom elevation, the thickness, the max concentration of TCE, really so we're, we're not just injecting blindly, we're using the best data that we have to create a targeted injection plan. So in conclusion, uh, when, when do we implement this 3D visualization technology and these automation tools? Because it's, it's not gonna be useful on every site. Uh, first and foremost, uh, any HRSC investigation. If you have MIP data, if you have LIF data, CPT data, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, the, the data is, you have, you have, the data is already formatted perfectly. You have tens of thousands of data points. It just makes fantastic 3D models extremely quickly. Uh, I'm talking 48, 72-hour turnaround time under a couple thousand dollars. It's, it's really a no-brainer for, for any type of those investigations. Uh, if you have LiDAR data, for kind of the same reasons, you, you're generating millions of data points, it just models extremely well in 3D. Uh, for any larger projects, uh, like I just presented, if, there's a, if, if a remediation <laughs> is planned, really there's, I don't think, a better way to calculate volumes of impacted soil and the mass of contamination and remediation options better than this. And then finally, uh, projects in litigation. In, in my opinion, there's, there's probably no better way to win a case than to present a, a, a fantastic visual, to, to convince a mediator, a judge, a jury, or, or people in the non-scientific community of, of what's going on. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's my contact information, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for listening. Thanks, great talk, Jim. I told everybody it was gonna be a great talk. Um, <laughs> We have some questions for Jim. We've got some time. I, I've got a question for you. Um, you're not going to get out that easy. So I, I'm just out of curiosity. When you're when you're looking at um, high-res data, especially like MIP data in combination with analytical data, and I noticed that site was was yet clays. Does the do you start to see how? Uh, MIP profiles may ha get some give drag down tendencies and how it as the smearing effects as you're pushing a MIP and and how you consider that in your in your model. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. We 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 see that we saw that at this site and if I put up the 3D model, you'll see that the MIP data there was much more impacts further down than actually the TC analytical data showed, and that's not from physical drag down of the contamination. It's from uh, the, the lines from the MIP, they basically get saturated with contamination. There could be some condensation in there. So then as you get past the contamination, you still might be getting clean air, but it's going through those lines that need to be cleaned out. So the MIP is really showing that uh, sometimes there's contamination deeper than what really is happening. Um, that being said, I think a MIP is still a really good technology to get your extents and, and uh, find where your contamination, sort of in orders of magnitude. It's, it's always tricky. Um, using the MIP to correlate to a concentration. But if you sort of use orders of magnitude, you could uh, figure out where your worst contamination is and where your, your limits are. Okay. So that gave everybody a minute to think of a question to ask Jim now. So <laughs> we got one up here up front. She's coming up. Is, are you coming with a speaker, um, a mic? That way everybody can hear your question. 
Here. We're putting you on mic. I'm just curious, what's your take about using Python uh, compared to R for this type of evaluation or uh, any other environmental data evaluation? That, that is uh, beyond my scope of uh, knowledge. I, I don't know R, and I, I know enough Python to get by only because EVS is, is written in Python. And that's what I use all the time, so, so really R wouldn't help me uh, in, in, in that. In the, but um, I'm sure it could be used in other uh, facets, but really for what I do in, in EVS, uh, it's really only Python. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Nice